Hello, welcome to Today in Bad Theology, where we look at one Roman Catholic priest's attempts to exorcise Satan from the U.S. Capitol building. Welcome back to Today in Bad Theology. It's been a little while since I've posted one of these. Life got in the way, but I did not want to let the month of February pass without discussing this one, a story that broke in late January. On January 6th, 2021, a mob stormed the United States Capitol building. And during that time, an independent interviewer uh, captured an interview with Reverend David Fulton, a Roman Catholic priest from Central City, Nebraska, who claimed to have performed an exorcism of the United States Capitol building. He has now gotten in trouble with his bishop in that diocese for, for what he did. Uh, it took a couple of weeks for this video to make the rounds and for someone to recognize who he was. This is bad theology, and I want to talk about why. So I want to talk a little bit about what, what he claims he did. I want to talk a little bit about what exorcisms claim to be. And then I want to talk to somebody who actually knows a little bit more about this than I do uh, to get a handle on what really went wrong here. So first of all, let's talk about what Fulton claimed he did. Reverend Fulton claimed that he exorcised a spirit of Baphomet from the United States Capitol. Uh, Baphomet is this guy, right? He, you see him around every now and then, you know, he, he does you know, funky jewelry stores at the mall or stuff you can find. He's, he's this idol that is, is portrayed this way. And Baphomet, um, is first recorded as being a guy uh, around the year 1000 or so. And it's during the Crusades, so a little bit after the year 1000. And uh, a, a priest records that the, the Muslim defenders of a city would scream the name Baphomet uh, as they were fighting. Uh, it is widely believed that this priest was not hearing very well uh, when the defenders invoked the name of Muhammad. And so he, he just got it wrong, and the name has stuck. Baphomet has been a favorite boogeyman uh, ever since. Uh, someone's doing something wrong, claim they're worshiping Baphomet, and build up a false narrative where you know, Baphomet they sacrifice to him. Uh, and, and that becomes the charge against them. Uh, the, the Knights Templar were accused of worshiping Baphomet. More recently, Baphomet has become a favorite uh, symbol in the Church of Satan. Um, in fact, you, you might have seen stories about um, when, when some American Christians decide that we need to depict the Ten Commandments uh, at public buildings, at, at, at you know, government facilities, uh, and the grounds are free, freedom of religious speech, um, Baphomet will often appear as sort of a counter-protest. Um, it's hard to tell, you know, is it tongue-in-cheek, is it deadly serious, whatever. It's, it is designed to protest uh, the, the depiction of this Judeo-Christian, uh, allegedly Judeo-Christian foundational text by saying, well, if, you can, if you're claiming religious freedom, then we can put Baphomet there, we, even if we don't care who he is. The fact is we can put him there. So this is the guy that, that Father Fulton claims to have expelled or tried to expel from the United States Capitol because he was trying to undermine America. So as, as part of the mob storming the building on the 6th um, was an attempt to remove Satan's demon from the building. Now this is bad theology. Okay. Why? It's not because the priest thought exorcism is a thing. Right? We might think exorcisms are BS, right? Exorcism is this old-fashioned way of thinking about the world. You know, in, in the days of Jesus, everything that could go wrong with you is caused by a demon. Some demons are, are nastier than others. Like there, there's the demon of male pattern baldness, who's just kind of a loser. And then there are demons that can cause real problems. And so an exorcist is one who casts them out. Well, but we, we know that. I actually inherited some genes from my dear uh, paternal grandmother, and that's why I have male pattern baldness. 
um, there are other problems in the world that are they're not caused by weird spirits that inhabit us, at least not that we think in our scientific or post-scientific mindset. The problem is uh, the church continues to talk about exorcism, and we do mean it. Exorcism, renouncing uh, Satan or attempting to cast out powers that are working against God, remains a piece of what churches do. We are serious about it. I'm willing to bet that if you are a churchgoer, you have witnessed and even participated in exorcisms without realizing it, perhaps. Um, every time we conduct the rite of holy baptism, there's an exorcism. Right? We have a part of the service during which we say that we renounce the ways of sin, the ways of death, the ways of the devil, the ways of whatever the powers are that are against God. We don't want anything to do with them. We want them to leave. And in the name of Jesus, we command them to get lost. This is usually in, in the Lutheran church that I serve in. This is a series of questions, three questions. Do you renounce the devil and all his empty promises? Do you renounce sin? Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? That's an exorcism. No, there's not usually someone screaming. Well, sometimes there is. Uh, there's not usually someone projectile vomiting. <laughs> it does happen. And usually it passes without any sort of weird thing that would make you say, oh, I recognize this as an exorcism. Um, but, but there is an exorcism. It's, it's, it's that classic scene from the Godfather, right? The baptismal scene. Michael Rizzi, do you renounce Satan? and all his works, and all his pomps. And Michael's, meanwhile, is having all of his enemies whacked. That's the exorcism. Think of the Godfather. Bazzini's dead. And Philip Tatalia. Mo Green. Stracci. Cuneo. I settled all church business today. Only don't tell me that we don't do exorcisms in church because it insults my intelligence. So what went wrong? Why is this bad theology to exorcise Baphomet from the U.S. Capitol if exorcism itself is not a problem? To get at that, I talked to a friend of mine, Pastor Dave, who knows more about exorcism than I do, and to whom I turn whenever I have questions about what exorcism actually is. I am here with Pastor Dave, who knows more about exorcism than I do, um, and that, that's not that hard to know more about exorcism than I do. Um, so exorcisms you know, are, are things that we do in the church, we do in them when we perform a baptism, but not everybody realizes that exorcisms are part of the tradition still. It's not a, a medieval thing or a Hollywood thing or... Can you say anything about, you know, are, are exorcisms performed still, do we know? Yeah, well, first of all, you mentioned uh, baptismal exorcism and um, in the Lutheran tradition, our tradition, uh, what remains of the baptismal exorcism is the renunciation of the devil and all his empty promises. Um, in a Catholic church, they take it a little bit further even to this day and the service begins with uh, the priest breathing into the face of the baptized and saying words, uh, something to the effect of uh, depart unclean spirit and make room for the Holy Spirit. Um, and that is sort of a, a way of beginning the baptismal rite, uh, kind of literally like it says, before the Holy Spirit's gonna come in, let's, let's make some room. Um, um, so that's still retained in uh, Roman Catholic churches to this day and um, some Lutheran churches, I believe the Lutheran church in Australia still includes that within their uh, baptismal rite. And it is within Martin Luther's baptismal booklet. Um, okay. So if you look in your book of Concord, uh, you'll see uh, that's still in there. But typical of Luther, he reduced the number of baptismal exorcisms from it's either five or three uh, down to one. Um, you know, Luther was always about, you know, well, <laughs> This is a poor metaphor, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, maybe in a baptism, we shouldn't be talking uh, about that. But, you know, he, he wants to still confront the devil in the baptismal rite. Uh, but he also 
wants to keep the emphasis on God's word rather than on what we do. And so that's a reason to say, oh, it's okay to do it once. We don't have to do it again and again. Uh, the devil's going to leave at the mere mention of God's word. He got the message. He's yeah, gone. That's right. Uh -huh. um, so that's, that's one form of exorcism uh, that still exists in the Lutheran church today um, and in uh, many churches today. There's also uh, less formal exorcisms. And I've because it's less formal, I really only have anecdotal stories of that. Those involve um, incidents of um, somebody acting up in worship in very bizarre ways, and the pastor confronts that person in the moment. Um, sometimes uh, those less formal exorcisms um, have taken place in people's homes as part of a pastoral visitation, usually involving the pastor and, say, the council president um, going to visit a a member of the church who um, they have reason to believe there's a there's an outside influence, mm -hmm. a, a demonic force of some kind um, exerting influence over that member, and those tend to be less formal. Um, uh, and because of that, we don't have a whole lot of data on that. Right. Um, yeah, so those are uh, those are sort of the non um, exorcist movie versions of exorcism that are right. still out there. Um, in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, there is uh, still an order of exorcists, um, and they do perform something closer to what you would see in the movies. Um, uh, and we can go into that in more well, detail yeah, if you'd like. Yeah. I think because one of the, the things that, about this that, that this pastor, uh, Father Fulton's bishop, has said is he was not the exorcist for his diocese, which you know strikes some people. Oh, you, you mean there is one? Well, yes, there is. And um, not being the exorcist and trying to go perform one, I mean, it is, is, it's not a thing that we do in the Lutheran church, but in the Roman Catholic church, that is the procedure, yes? I mean, you, you have to, the bishop gets involved and the church gets involved. Um, can you say anything about, you know, do you, what, do you, what do we know about that? I know you're not, I don't want, we, we don't know everything because they actually don't tell us everything that's part of the point. Yeah, um, so I had to be careful in my research, and I did focus more on uh, what Martin Luther believed about exorcism mm -hmm. and how to apply that to the Lutheran Church uh, today. And I do want to mention um, my research never um, reached the point of looking at uh, practices of the Lutheran Church in Africa. Uh, so there are places in Africa where, because of their context, exorcism has a very different meaning and is practiced quite regularly. Um, my research didn't quite get to that point. If I do more with it, uh, that's gonna be a major area of focus for me. Um, so I don't wanna just gloss over, but unfortunately my real um, area of study was um, Martin Luther in the 16th century and then how what he believed applies to us today. Um, but yeah, the, uh, so the Episcopal Church in America um, uh, very explicitly says in one of their um, books of order um, that you've got to go talk to your bishop before you do anything uh, mm -hmm. remotely uh, related to exorcism. And it's similar for the Roman Catholic Church. They have specially trained priests who serve as the exorcist uh, for their diocese. And um, it's um, the idea of a priest simply doing an exorcism on the fly without, um, uh, without consulting with their bishop just flies in the face of everything I'm aware of with the Roman Catholic Church. It's a different situation if you're confronted by somebody, as I mentioned, the, the yeah. sort of exorcism you have to do when somebody starts acting out. Um, that's, there's a term for that called charismatic exorcism, and that's an exorcism that's done when um, somebody possibly possessed uh, by a demonic force uh, confronts um, a church leader, and you're reacting in the moment. Um, but the, you know that's not the situation with this priest, as far as I understand. He went there and thought he could just perform an exorcism outside the walls of the Capitol. I, it just seems very strange, based on everything I'm aware of. Well, yeah, and you, you mentioned having to involve the bishop. His bishop said no. He had not was not even consulted about this. Um, and this guy is not the exorcist. And one of the things that I was curious about was was. The way the, this exorcism was part of a, a mob that stormed the building, and the way people have described this mob varies kind of with their political views, but they, they, the police declared it a riot. And to, in the midst of a riot, to be performing an exorcism upon the building you are storming, 
um, it, it's struck me as I don't think that's how that works. Uh, um, but you know, is is what what is the deal with the the the, the person who's having the exorcism performed, do they consent to what's going on? I mean, is this even something that's allowed? Well, I think that's a challenging question because of course, you know, people reject treatment for their ailments um, quite often, whether it's a spiritual ailment, ailment or psychological. So consent is gonna be a tricky question um, when we're talking about exorcism. I think you're right though, to bring up the contrast between a rite of exorcism which is meant to reclaim a person or a building uh, for its proper use and sort of expelling um, a, um, an outside influence. Pairing that with people rushing into a building to disrupt the lawmakers from doing what they are supposed to be doing, just see, it's like, I don't understand how that works. Um, um, furthermore, you know, um, in terms of exorcism-like things that are still um, quite common in the church, and I would say this is the most common form aside from uh, what happens in a baptism. I imagine there's a lot of pastors out there who do house blessings and don't think of it as an exorcism, but I hear a lot of stories of people who say, you know, I feel uncomfortable in my home um, and I would love for you to come by and bless it, pastor, and a lot of pastors do that, and it is part of our ministry of sort of reclaiming a space uh, for, a, for the people who are there. And again, so the idea of doing something like that at the Capitol, and yet there, there's people rushing in um, to the Capitol while he's performing. The incongruity is, the juxtaposition is just sort of um, tying my brain in knots as you bring this up. Um, no, it doesn't, doesn't really create, really, it's not a happy tension, it's a WTF tension kind of yeah, like. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Now, and it's funny because I, I had colleagues, some of whom, uh, and, and sort of joking, I think, about the need to perform an exorcism like in the Oval Office once Donald Trump left office. And, and of course, they made that joke prior to this priest's video coming up. And um, you know, that's clear, clearly this idea here is that you know, an exorcism could be real and could be necessary. And then you're just down to what your political views are, apparently. Um, what, what was wrong, in your opinion, with this, this Pastor Fulton's approach to what he was doing? Well, again, he seems to be um, operating as a Lone Ranger, and exorcism is um, such a, um, an intense intervention. Um, and because of that, every tradition I'm aware of, well, I shouldn't say every tradition, um, um, but um, <laughs> the more organized uh, denominations uh, really try to put in some stop gaps so that we're not using it for political purposes. Um, that we're not using it to confirm our own bias. Uh, and that's why you involve bishops and fellow, um, fellow pastors or priests. Um, the one who performs an exorcism, again, if they have the opportunity to plan ahead, they are supposed to go to confession. Um, so that their conscience is clear and they are assured of God's promises for them before they try to um, take on uh, such a powerful foe as the devil. And, um, and so that's, that's what continues to trouble me with what I know about this incident, that the priest sort of did this willy-nilly and um, uh, didn't, didn't follow the sorts of um, procedures that are meant to make sure we're not just um, using such a powerful intervention haphazardly. And for that reason, I would be very cautious about making it part of the transition of power to perform an exorcism in the Oval Office. Yeah. Do we really want to say that every time we have a new president, we have to exercise the presence of the previous president? Yeah. That's, that's very upsetting to me. Well, and I, of course, I half jokingly would say, if you honestly think there are any sorts of prayers that will eliminate the brokenness of the political system, um, we would have prayed them already. That's right. <laughs> we, we would have done something about this years ago if it could be done. Um, As Pastor Dave mentioned, the problem is this guy went it alone and acted against his own faith community's instructions on how exorcisms are supposed to happen. Exorcisms are powerful faith events that are not to be used willy-nilly and not to be used on your own initiative in this way. 
An exorcism is a real thing, but it happens in a faith community. And faith is something that we share. Theology is something that we share. This is bad theology in large part because it is entirely personal. One man's attempt to undertake this spiritual struggle. Theology is something we do in a group. If your theology is completely different from anybody else's, you probably need to ask yourself, why is it you believe what you do? And is it just perhaps possible that I might have gotten a few things wrong? Because theology is something we do together. And when you have an exorcism, at least in, in most churches, it's the faith community working together. And in community, we can check each other. We can say, uh, I don't think an exorcism is needed here. Or, I don't think you're right about that. We keep each other in line. We keep each other sane. We keep each other grounded so that we don't do something like this. One other thing, and Pastor Dave does not mention this, but I will. The fact that there's an assumption that the spirit of Baphomet, Satan, is in the United States Capitol and that this is mentioned during a mob storming the Capitol, a mob that flashes the QAnon symbol freely as they do so. It, it, it's hard not to see this as wrapped up in the QAnon conspiracy theory that there is actually a cabal of Satan-worshipping Jews in the United States Capitol who are you know, cannibals and undermining reality uh, and, and must be stopped. This screams conspiracy theory. Once again, conspiracy theories are not good theology. So this is bad theology in a couple of counts. Thanks for being with me today. If you liked this video or like things like this, please click subscribe and like. Uh, I hope to be with you a little bit more frequently in the future, um, but I'm glad I could be with you today. Many thanks to Pastor Dave, and I'll see you all around.